When a small child disappeared in Alaska, investigators were initially unsure whether the cause was a grizzly bear or an abduction. The discovery of a fiber, a piece of molten steel, and a chip of yellow, glossy paint pointed police in the direction of a human. But others weren't so sure. As the Alaskan summer drew to a close in 1991, children in the small town of Taslina spent as much time outside as possible. They knew that in just a few short weeks, school would start and along with it, the cold Alaskan winter. The Lemaire family enjoyed life in the Alaska wilderness with hunting, fishing, and riding four-wheel vehicles. 11-year-old Mandy LaMere was the oldest child. She was a real interesting mix between a tomboy and a pretty little girl. She could be just as comfortable in a frilly dress at a, at a social event as she could in hip boots uh, standing on the river fishing. The town of Taslina has only 241 residents so the homes are situated some distance apart. Mandy and her best friend, April, often walked a mile or more to meet their friends to play. That was the plan on August 22nd, 1991. Mandy and I took off. We got about down to the wheelbarrow down there. I had a big fanny pack on and I had tripped and skinned up my leg. Um, I came back up here to the store and they helped me out. I got all cleaned up. Mandy was supposed to wait for me. But Mandy may have grown impatient. I ran back down, didn't find Mandy. Mandy always played pranks, and so we thought she was hiding in the bushes when we were gonna come out and scare us or something. Um, she never did. Two hours later, Mandy's father called police. Within hours, 75 friends and neighbors passed out flyers and searched the heavily wooded area from the ground and from the air. I knew that there was something wrong and that there was no way that she could have got lost. Alaskan State Trooper Jim McCann drove five hours from Fairbanks to join the search. I came down here with the opinion that there's more to this than, uh, uh, than certainly a grizzly attack or, or a child lost in the woods, just from what I read in the paper and from what I've been told over the telephone. This is the poster that they hung out when they found out Mandy was missing. That says missing, Mandy LaMare, long blonde hair, straight, five foot, weighs 105 to 110 pounds, age 11. And I wrote she was my best friend. The search lasted for days. Search dogs were used, but they weren't able to track Mandy's scent. I've never seen such community action. I've, I've been in on it and headed up a lot of searches. But this community was just marvelous. Everybody from the valley got together. Tragically, 10 days after she disappeared, searchers found her body. She had been shot to death. She was found about a mile from her home off of Taslina Terrace Road, back a side road in a new subdivision there. Her body was found off that road that went down to the river from that area. Without you have living something like this, you probably will never have a clue. And I don't know that I can describe it. My wife at the time, she ultimately couldn't handle it. I don't think no matter what you do, you always feel some kind of guilt. And that was the big thing. If I hadn't tripped, what would have happened? And I remember asking my mom that. What would, have, what would have happened if I hadn't tripped? Complicating matters, there had been heavy rains a few days before the body was discovered. 
washing away possible trace evidence as well as foot and tire impressions. It was clear to us that uh, that she'd been alive when she was down in that wash and had been struggling to climb back up out of that wash. Her little fingernails were broken and, and filled with dirt. Police knew they'd have to work harder than usual to find necessary clues. Mandy Lemire's autopsy revealed she had been shot twice at close range with a 22 caliber rifle. There were signs of sexual assault. In a search for suspects, an informant told police that construction worker David DeForest showed an unusual interest in the case and spoke of it constantly at work. 20 years earlier, DeForest was convicted of a car theft in New York State and had some recent brushes with the law. He had been in some trouble recently when he went out of state, and he was a suspect in a, a death out of state, too. DeForest denied any involvement in Mandy's murder. His employer confirmed he was at work on the day Mandy disappeared, so he wasn't considered a suspect. But DeForest had some information of his own. He saw another local man, Charlie Smithart, driving his pickup truck on the road where Mandy was last seen. He was described as a good guy to the kids, that all the Copper Center kids would come to his shop and he would uh, fix their bicycles, give them candy. Certainly interesting to us. 61-year-old Smithart was a retired steel worker, had been divorced twice, and lived in a makeshift workshop behind his mother's home. Coincidentally, Smithart had assisted in the search for Mandy. He never put his name down on the search roster at the fire station to say that I am a member of this search team, I will search, but he would show up there and stand around, and then he would go off on his own. Uh, we found that strange. Smithart denied DeForest's claim that he was near the crime scene on the day Mandy disappeared and said he had an alibi. He said he was watching television with his mother, an alibi his mother confirmed. God knows he didn't do it. And the per person who committed this crime knows that Charles didn't do it. In a town the size of Taslina, checking an alibi is easier than in most larger towns, and it helped investigators get their first break. They learned that Smith Hart's mother, Lucille, had gone shopping at the Copper River Cash Grocery Store on the day of Mandy's disappearance and paid for the items with a check. The time and date on the register tape was the same, and the time was 3.17 when Lucy said that she was home with her son, and she wasn't home, she was at the grocery store buying groceries at that time. Suddenly that blew a hole in Charlie's alibi because it meant that his mother was at the grocery store at 317, that she was not at home when Smith Art said uh, she was at home to bolster his alibi, and that frankly he had no alibi for the two hours um, when Mandy disappeared. 200 miles away in Anchorage, Criminalists used a gel adhesive tape to gather any trace evidence left behind by the killer. The tape lifts the evidence, but the adhesive isn't so strong that the trace elements can't be removed for later analysis. Investigators noticed what was perhaps their first clue. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, did you see that? There's something shiny, something. And we kept moving around at different angles until we could see something. The spheres were no larger than the head of a pin. Under a fiber optic microscope, the spheres looked like metal. They also found several red and blue fibers and a yellow paint chip. Could these few microscopic items help investigators find a killer? This is an 11-year-old girl who had her life savagely taken from her, she was brutally killed, and her body was left in the woods for animals to find. I think that made it hard on everybody that dealt with this case, and myself included. In the weeks following Mandy Lemire's murder, 
investigators had a very promising lead. A witness placed Charlie Smith Art near Mandy's home on the day of the abduction. And some young girls in town had even more damaging information to report. In the weeks before Mandy's disappearance, Charlie Smith Art, a 60-year-old man, had been seen offering rides to other young girls who bore a striking resemblance to Mandy Lemaire, such that one of the young girls, uh, when her mother saw the um, sketch in the newspaper of Mandy, Mandy was missing, that she, th she thought she was looking at a, um, at a sketch of her own daughter. Armed with a search warrant, investigators confiscated Smith Hart's pickup truck for forensic analysis. With a gel adhesive, criminalists lifted microscopic particles from the truck's interior. During questioning, investigators noticed something else about Smith Hart. I couldn't take my eyes off his shirt because he had little sparkly things on his shirt. And I finally asked him, I said, what are those little sparkly things on your shirt, Charlie? He says, I don't know, brass, aluminum, I'm, I'm grinding stuff all the time. That clue led investigators to the workshop behind Smith Hart's mother's home. There, criminalists collected paint samples, hair, fibers, and all of the metal fragments they could find. They also confiscated a pair of Smith Hart's overalls. All of the evidence was shipped to Chicago, Illinois, to Skip Palahniuk, a research microscopist. Palahniuk began by looking at the small yellow paint chip found on Mandy's clothing. Using X-ray spectroscopy, Palahniuk noticed something unique. Glossy layers with no other layers behind it and a variety of colors. That's quite unusual. And children's bicycles, of course, are painted with single layers of glossy paint. In the samples collected from Smith Hart's workshop, Palahniuk found a paint chip identical in elemental and polymer composition to the paint chip on Mandy's clothing. We found one paint chip where the paint chip was in every aspect we could measure was the same as, the, as one of the yellow paint chips from his uh, workshop. Next, with the red and blue fibers. Again, Palahniuk found they too were unusual. It turns out these fibers had a very unusual cross section. The fibers were also very brittle. They were brittle because of degradation due to age and exposure. The fibers were triangular in shape or trilobal. Using an infrared spectrometer, Palahniuk discovered the fibers were polypropylene a synthetic manufactured by the Philips Fiber Company for carpeting. Palahniuk then analyzed the fibers gathered from Smith Hart's truck and clothing. We find in Smith Hart's environment exactly the same kinds of fibers. Not only do they have the same cross-sectional shape, the same size, they have the same pigments that are used to color them. Everything is there. The fibers in Smith Hart's truck were manufactured by the same company and had the same degree of environmental damage as those found on Mandy's clothing. Finally, Palahniuk examined the most unusual evidence, the metallic spheres found all over Mandy's skin and clothing. The scanning electron microscope identified the spheres as carbon steel. From his experience, Palahniuk knew precisely what had shaped the metal in this way. Here, using a high-speed cutting tool to cut through steel, uh, you'll produce these little spheres. The metal particle is raised to a high enough temperature that it actually melts and assumes a spherical form. The metal spheres from Mandy's clothing were compared to metal fragments found on the seat of Smith Art's truck. These particles on Mandy's body were consistent in all respects with having originated from Mr. Smith Art's environment, based on my knowledge of the particles, is that it would be extremely unlikely to have all those particles come together just by chance somewhere else. 
Now armed with forensic evidence, investigators wanted to learn as much as they could about Smithart's background. So they flew to California to interview one of his daughters. There, they found evidence that Mandy LaMare wasn't his first victim. We walked around in, out in her front yard and down her road uh, for a couple of hours until she trusted me and uh, with tears in her eyes said that her, her father had started molesting her, interestingly, at the age of 11, the same age as Mandy LaMare was when she was murdered, and that all her sisters had also been molested. After a three-month investigation, Charlie Smithhart was arrested for the kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of Mandy LaMare. It wasn't soon enough for Mandy's family. I can tell you, the temptation was strong to take matters in my own hands. I won't lie to you. But I had told myself that I could never explain it to two boys. Many residents of Taslina found it difficult to believe that a neighbor could commit such a heinous crime. The community was very split up there. It's a very half native, half white community. And Mandy was white and Charlie was native. And he had the split down the center essentially, that the white community felt that he was involved and the native community felt that he was not involved. Charlie Smith Hart's trial began in 1993, two years after the crime. Mandy's parents and her two little brothers sat in the first row every day of the trial. Smithart insisted he was innocent. Mr. Smithart, you're going to have to be quiet at this point. Are you going to put me in jail? You're going to um, throw me in jail? I've been in jail 20 months, falsely arrested for a crime I did not commit. Mr. Smithart, I'm going to have to have you removed from the courtroom. That's I fine. I don't want to do that. Throw me in jail. I've been in there for 20 months, falsely arrested for a crime I did not commit. Prosecutors believe that molten steel from Smith Hart's metal work formed the tiny spheres that were attached to his shirt. Smith Hart was wearing that same shirt when he saw Mandy walking to meet her friends. It's unclear whether Mandy accepted Smith Hart's offer of a ride or whether he forced her into his vehicle. The forensic evidence suggests the tiny metal spheres attached to Smith Hart's shirt were transferred onto the seat of his truck and later onto Mandy's clothing during the abduction. The same red and blue synthetic trilobal carpet fibers were in the truck and on Mandy's clothing. A single yellow speck of glossy paint from Smith Hart's workshop was also found on Mandy LaMare. Even after two weeks in the woods and after heavy rains, trace elements were still there. The murder weapon was never recovered. Prosecutors believe Smith Hart may have dumped it in the Taslina River. This type of killer will do this again. And hopefully I'll still be locked up. And then, what are you people gonna say? If it happens, my, to my way of thinking, you're an accessory to him, you're an accessory to him, and the troopers that investigated this case, because I know I'm innocent. Skip Palahniuk's testimony was particularly persuasive. My role is to come in and report factually on what I found, and then be an advocate, not for one side or the other, but for my opinion and I stated my opinion in court, and then hopefully gave the jury something useful to base their uh, deliberations on, and finally their verdict. I felt like they did a really good job of explaining it. I'd ask our oldest son what he heard, and he could explain it. Adults should be able to understand it. Charles Smith Hart was found guilty of murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and he was sentenced to 114 years in prison. Mr. Lemaire introduced me to his son, who he said was somewhat interested in forensic science. And what he handed me is a courtroom sketch he had made, hand-drawn, 
picture with the words written on it, thank you for helping catch my sister's killer. That kind of thing does tug at your heartstrings. This crime affected everyone in Taslina in different ways. Now that I live in her old house, it, it haunts me. My memories come back. Certain smells bring back memories. Um, my son sleeps in her old bedroom, and there's a sticker on the window that she and I had stuck there when we were little girls. Some people think it ought to be over. It's never over. I went through awful days leading up to when Mandy's graduation would have been. For years prior, I couldn't go to graduations. I then several years after that, when girls that would have been Mandy's age were being married, were getting married, I couldn't go to those. It's a whole life long. She's not here. She, I'm missing this time of her life. Six years later, Alaska Supreme Court overturned Smith Hart's conviction because some evidence the defense team had planned to introduce had been denied. Smith Hart died of lung cancer in an Alaska prison while awaiting a retrial. <laughs>